More questions? Yeah. I'm a little indecisive, so I, I'm, I'm have a difficulty on making a decision. So, how can I um, make a decision easily? You have to go to Seoul Grand Park and uh, go face to face with the tiger. <laughs> then this tiger helps you. Don't become tiger's food, okay? I didn't say that. But you go face to face with the tiger like this. Then this tiger will give you very good teaching. It will help your decision making so much like no other human being can. So I'm teaching you in a very gentle way. And sometimes this gentle way is very inefficient because you can keep a distance from it. But from tiger, cannot. Tiger goes right into your face. And, wow. Okay. Then you attain something. Maybe tiger also attains something. It's up to you. <laughs> okay. So, what does this really mean? Get yourself into a situation. You can start with Seoul Grand Park, but it will give you just one moment of teaching. In fact, tiger is powerful. So. Tiger has really kind of simple mind, but it's a very, very strong predator. And his mind is very, very, very clear about food, meat, <laughs> sleep, mating, friend or foe. Decisions for tiger is no problem. You never see a tiger just say, should I eat this little thing <laughs> or not? Or do I prefer mandu today? Hmm. <laughs> Definitely, it will just eat that poor little bit, boom, just like that. So don't become tiger's food. But tiger will help you with your decision because you go face to face. And then when you learn something, when you actually get some little push, then get yourself into a correct human situation. This human situation means you get the right friends and the right opponents to shape your existence, to shape your mind. And you choose. It, it's usually related to something. Somebody wants to do sports, and they get into a sports club, and they immediately have some human relationship. Some people go to a Zen, Zen group, they meditate, immediately have some relationship. Somebody, you know, go to a kind of hobby, you know, group, and they make, you know, these little model trains together, you know, they make these models, and immediately they have some relationship. So usually indecisiveness reflects a problem in relationship. So get into the right situation, find your right place, and then this helps you with the relationship. Relationship. And that gives you what you really need function. I mean, the traffic in Seoul is a great situation because the relationship is extremely clear. Everybody wants to go forward as fast as they can. And then your function is also clear. But if your mind is wavering and moving, then in the first five minutes you get into an accident. So Seoul traffic is a great situation to exercise relationship and function. Right? That's why I use the subway. So, <laughs> but I, I used to drive, and if necessary, I still drive. But uh, there's nothing like soul traffic. I can testify. So, if you enter the right situation and you keep your sense of relationship, then really these relationships help you. And then function becomes smooth and automatic. You don't have to think about your decisions too much. You become part of the flow. And I cannot kind of define this better, the flow. This flow of humans over time and space, over various locations, various situations, you know? Traffic has a flow. It's regulated by the traffic lights, more or less, and then and the rules. So you become part of this flow, and it just goes. But if you start thinking, then there's many honking and horns and people 
what is this guy doing here? You know? So put down your doubts, your superfluous thinking, and become one. Good situation is a tough situation. It teaches you. That's why Tiger can teach you. And then your relationship will become very clear, <laughs> and also your function. Okay? Yes? Now, when you do the retreat, and then there are some place for that. Yeah, while well, you select some uh, retreat place, that, that which some place like so called uh, Myeongdang, for, I mean, yeah. there are right for you. Mm -hmm. But mostly that Korean temples are located in Myeongdang, is, uh, you know. But uh, in, in, as you experience in the retreat in the past, there are, do you experience that uh, some place are, you are doing better than other places for retreat? Yeah. Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> Any place is good for retreat, OK? Anyone. But if you build a new one, then it's better to build a very good quality in terms of nature karma, material karma, and mental karma. This whole world is a retreat place, except that we fail to notice it. You can do practicing anywhere. But if you really want to give people refuge, and we really want them to recharge their energy and become clear, then this specific retreat place, which you mentioned as your Nyodang, is really, really important. So in that sense, it's good to have correct nature karma. The nature karma is more or less described by Feng Shui or Pung Sujiri, because the body of this earth operates really like a human body in relation to your energy points. It's like acupuncture. You put a needle to the right place, the whole arm or the whole body is affected. You put a needle to the wrong place, it's just painful and nothing happens. Acupuncture? Good. So <laughs> what happens with the earth is the same. You find the right place, you put the temple there, then that energy which the temple generates is spreading everywhere. Okay? That's why specific places are sought for, they are searched, they are found, they are bought at a very, very high price, and then this temple or any kind of establishment can start to function there. So that's nature karma. And nature karma, we had better not change. I mean, some human beings, especially you know, during old communist times in Europe and Eastern Europe, they said, hmm, we don't have a mountain here, let's make one. Or we have this river flowing this way, why don't we turn it around and make it flow backwards? Because we need the water there. Now that resulted in total and absolute disasters. Because we thought that we can just play with it. Humans can conquer nature, you know, that's a European idea, Western idea. And then nature doesn't care if we are stupid, we just make our lives very difficult and a lot of homework for us and a lot of cleanup to do. So nature karma, we had better not touch. Where mountains were born, there are mountains. Where there's river, there's river. So let the mountain stay tall and let the river flow. That would be a correct relationship to nature. So the first part of a good, you know, Myeongdang is nature karma. So every place has a certain karma because either there is mountain or not. Either the river is there or not. Small river, big river, steep mountain, wide valley, narrow valley, it's all there. So nature karma, as the old Chinese character and the corresponding Korean term shows, has to have two important things, pung and su. So if we have that in correct proportion, not too much water and not too little, mountains that are not too high and not too low, not too close and not too far, then the nature karma is clear. And we had better just bow to it, quickly install a sun shingak and bow to it. Then that's the kind of focus point of nature's energy. And then if you honor nature, nature accepts you. That's the kind of 
mental root of any correct relationship. And that's what actually will make people, if we practice and teach this in the right way, really keep nature clean. Not to destroy it, not to pollute it. We really need that attitude in whatever way we can. We can teach and we should teach people that nature is alive. Nature is just like us, except it doesn't talk. And uh, we have to re be really observant and not develop any incorrect relationship to nature. So don't change it. Observe it, honor it, and become one with it. Then nature will give you correct teaching. So nature karma must be correct, and there are many, 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 many parameters which I don't mention here. You can visit temples in Korea. We have quite a few thousand temples and observe how they are located. That's how we gathered whatever experience we have in terms of Fung Su, which is not much. On my side, I did not learn it. I observed those many, many dozens and dozens of temples I visited, and I drew some conclusions that are far from closed, and I keep improving through observation. It will never stop. But if nature karma is clear, then the second part is material karma. Now, that's all the real estate, all the infrastructure, everything that humans be, hu human beings make. And that has a direct effect on nature karma. You find a perfect Pung Sujiri place, but there are 63 air flights above that place every single day. Or there is a, a kind of slaughterhouse within one kilometer. Or there are two Gosok Toros intersecting right before your valley. Or there is a hydroelectric dam binding your river to this huge lake, you know. That's material karma, and human beings have power over it, but we usually don't use it in harmony with nature. Well, we used to live at Wagesa. We walked up to Samsongam many times, and if you go up to Samsongam, it's really worth it. Take the walk. It's a beautiful hermitage, very strong place, good chanting there. And uh, you look from the kind of Yosache area, which has like a parapet, like a, an edge, and you look over to Miyadong, Sanmundong, a little bit of Hagiadong. You can see towards Ujongbu a little bit. And you see how human beings are just sprawling, proliferating using these huge high-rise apartments to become more and more and more numerous. This just looks like in that, that point and several other points on this earth like some kind of indefinable cancer which eats nature. Actually, that's what depletes the Samgaksan energy. There's millions of people that are living in that big valley from Ujongbu down to the center of Seoul. So material karma is important, and if you want to make a clear retreat place, make sure that it's more or less clear. That's why national parks are so precious. Okay? And that we can change. You can negotiate that the road would go somewhere else. You can negotiate that you know, the power lines would run someplace else. But I doubt you can kind of renegotiate a nuclear power plant. It's kind of difficult. Very hard to change. This takes a lot of money and power. This takes just observation and clear mind to notice. And with nature karma, something is really important. Just following the patterns, the mountain and, and water layouts is not enough. You have to have su sufficient experience in good places, what it feels like to practice in a strong and clear place. And then you try that. And if your practice experience confirms what you see, then it's good. Okay? This is a really important point. It cannot be decided by just measurements. Okay? Then third, up here, so that you could see it, it's called mental karma. This mental karma is very, very interesting, and this can only be changed by practicing. For instance, if you had 
in an earlier example, I've said that a slaughterhouse next to your place, then there's a lot of killing karma there, a lot of suffering karma there. Okay? Or if you had a discotheque 20 meters from your place, then there's a lot of you know, dancing, entertainment, you know, lose my mind type of karma there. And it had, if, if it was going on, it's not bad, you can still go there, it's no problem. <laughs> so, and if you have some really strong mental karma, then only some clear practice can move that. In one of our Zen centers in America, there used to be an old age home for very senior citizens. And right next to it, there was a kind of psychiatric ward for mental patients. And that was there for about 40 years or maybe less, but for decades. And the uh, people, when uh, our school bought that building, for 10 years, they had to practice really hard to clean that out. And it has changed tremendously. So this is something not to be defined. We cannot really define this, but there is a mental part which is significant, which is really important, and that takes a lot of energy to clean up too. Okay? Nature karma, material karma, mental karma, all belongs to that particular place. Okay? And if we choose in the right way, then our retreat place will be a true refuge for the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And as I began this chapter, I hasten to add, any place is good for practice. You can do that. But if you have a choice, you can use these principles. Okay? More questions? Yeah, go ahead. Just um, um, a toil, the prostration mm -hmm. as a way of practice. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just uh, give your opinion or comment on that? Why? <laughs> well, I, I was a scenic. And I really didn't believe in this form of practice. Cynic? Ah, cynical. Cyn okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm cynical. But uh, I just, I mean, for a long time, I just, I guess I just so used to live with only with my head. And I didn't really believe in it. I started it, and I can feel it's really working, not just this level, but a little down there. I guess. I guess but I still am too attached to the understanding and need to know why it is working for me. <laughs> Maybe because so that I don't, you know, return to not doing it. Um. Oh my God. <laughs> if you are attached to understanding, why do you expect me to make more for you? You already tried bowing. Right? You already tried bowing. Yes. And, uh, you already experienced the benefits. Now you want some safeguards from me that you would not return to your former self, which was without bowing. And guess what? I'm not going to give that to you. Now, you know why? I want you to grow up. Use your own experience. And if you really want to know what it is like to live without bowing, just stop. But then don't be surprised. <laughs> so it's really good to go into a retreat. Because in retreat, you have a schedule. You follow it. You bow with others. You chant with others. You sit with others. You eat with others. And then this Dharma bowl with all the karmic potatoes in it, that's us, become more clear. But then get out of the bowl and get into the earth again and get dirty again, you know. That's a pretty good experience. That really underlines the importance of correct practice. Like I said right at the beginning, when we talked about 1 in 10,000, don't be afraid to do that. Just don't damage yourself and others. You want the experience? Go for it. That's what makes you an adult person. If you see that it's damaging or irre ir irreversible, be careful and don't go into things that you don't believe that you need to have. Because this kind of motivation, you believe you need this. You believe this makes you a better practitioner. You believe that this will make you a better person. Go. Do it. No matter what people say. But if you don't believe this 100%, then your own doubt destroys you. Okay? That's how some people stay alive on the battlefield. That's how some people die. 
you are afraid out there, you have doubts out there, the bullets find you. You're going totally without thinking. Just go, 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 go. Some people are alive and some people are dead. Okay? So, don't expect me to comment on the exquisite and exalted nature of bowing. You already understand. Do that. And if you want to understand what it is without it, don't want a recipe against that. I'll not put hindrances into your consciousness. Okay? More questions? Pastor uh, uh, this is my first time for your teaching, and uh, uh, I think uh, I heard that this is the last time. No, not for you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, first and last time for me, and uh, I have, I, I'm, I'm student studying science, uh, physics, physics. Physics, wonderful. <laughs> My young physicist friend, what is your question? Uh, I practice Chamson and I do my what is uh, what is it and uh, um, I have some uh, questions. Uh, my my uh, physics uh, study uh, requires very mental mental works for myself and uh, um, so many many Sunim Sunim said that uh, I have to practice always with my what or uh, when you were live. When you're eating, when you're walking, when you're even even when you're not practicing chamson, but I have to I have to do my uh, my study by my mental work. So I sometimes uh, hesitate to, uh, what to think. I ha I always I always think about my physics or some um, formulas and some um, concepts of the physics, but. Um, Sunim, when Sunim says you have to, when you when you do a chamson, you have to you have to live with your hadu, always thinking what is it, what is it, what is it. Um, it's uh, it's hard for me. Which which one to do it? Like I said before, do not make opposites in your mind. Do not let your hadu become thinking, and this hadu thinking opposes your physics thinking. Don't do that. It's the wrong kind of practice. You are a young scientist. You are using your computer very much. You have a lot of processing power. But what's really important in a computer is this button, which can switch it off. Everything else is optional. But if you don't have this button to turn off your computer, then you can overheat and your mind snaps. It becomes functionally independent of your own will. So what you want doesn't happen in your mind. That's a form of mental disorder. Your mind thinks, 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 and you can't turn it off. Okay? Functionally, functionally independent, but it's in your body. You know? It's you, but you have no control over it. Now, for that, meditation is very good. How to find this off switch to unplug yourself and return before thinking. So, what I mean here is, first, Huadu is not thinking. Huadu does not equal the words, what am I? But now I have to... Let me finish. Kwadu and physics, they are not opposites, okay? So this relationship is not correct. But use the Kwadu as a switch to your thinking. And then physics becomes question, and later question becomes physics. So your job, when you don't want to think, is really to sit down, watch your breath, observe your thinking, direct your attention to it. Don't oppose it. Don't run away from it. Direct your attention to it and ask, what is this? Physics. Oh, absolutely. 
And this kind of clear observation of your thinking and taking the energy out of your thinking and returning to your question, that helps you become very good physicist. This sounds like I'm going right direction. So. I'm very happy for you. So continue. And then your intuition will work on your physics. That's don't know. It's not your, cognit your cognitive conscious thinking. It's your intuition. It's your subconscious. And then very interesting things can come out. So this is not in opposite relationship. But when you do a lot of thinking and a lot of thinking, you sit down, keep your eyes open, otherwise chaos. Keep your eyes open, observe your breath, and like in a mirror, what is this really? And you don't have to attach to the words. Don't attach to the words, just observe. And this question helps you seeing it, perceiving it, like in a mirror. And then if you keep your energy with the question in the tanjon, your physics thinking disappears, and you're free. Then you can go play basketball, you know, with your friends, go to a movie, enjoy life. Enjoy life. You're young. Do that. So, then correct mind practice results in correct physics, too. But if you are with your friends and you still think of physics and you eat, but you eat your kind of formulas and you don't eat the food, then you are missing the hobakjuk. <laughs> hobakjuk is delicious. So don't eat physics instead of hobakjuk. Taste clearly. When you are with your friends in a movie, watch the movie. Don't watch your physics thinking, okay? Watch the movie, etc. When you're with your friends, share that company and don't think about physics. And meditation helps you. It, it operates as a switch, really, just and then you switch off physics thinking. Then you go back home, then you make a decision. Okay, time to get back to my job, to my good scientific career. You enter your little study room, there is your book, or you have some homework in your mind, and then you turn it on. Then you use it as long as you want. Then, if you don't know, because Huadu is basically don't know. It's not words. It's not the sentence of the question. It's don't know. Okay? I emphasize this because if you are attached to the words of the Huadu, it's like Majo sitting forever, or Huang Byok Sunim, you know, rubbing the tire. Very important. Don't attach to the words of the Huadu. Use the Huadu to attain Don No and return physics thinking to Don No. And out of this Don No, again, when necessary, comes physics thinking. Okay? So learn to forget. It's very useful. If you learn how to forget, then your learning process of anything will be very good. Your mind stays fresh and clear. You can acquire new knowledge. But if you cannot delete things, then your hard drive will be full very soon. Then you have a problem. Many, many scientists got stuck in their middle age, like 40, 45, because they reached their mental limits. They couldn't clear out their consciousness. They couldn't use their intuition. Everything was in their conscious intellect. And it was working all the time. Okay? Families were lost because of that. You know, I have, I have programmer friends. And they soon just had one computer and everybody else disappeared around them. That was it. And they, they realized that this is not life. This is something else. And they're turning themselves into machines. So they stopped that. So, real mastery of your karma depends on your don't know mind. So, use your don't know to really perceive your thinking. And when necessary, like a good servant, like a good dog, your thinking comes and it does the job. But when it's not necessary, turn it off, send the dog back to the cot, to the little dog house, let it sleep. Okay? Is this clear for you? Good. Do that. More questions? Yeah. Uh, I feel like today there's so many ghosts. Ghosts? Yeah. 
let's say 20, 30. Ghosts? Yeah. Wow. We have some serious cleanup to do. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and I don't, I'm wondering what it would be like if uh, we have 20, 30 authentic people, not just ghost, let's say. And where does this ghost in your mind come from? Oh, uh, maybe I got over generalized. You know, today looks like I'm uh, not authentic me. I'm just here as a ghost, or you know, just. A Fortunately, I have I have good news for you. You are not a ghost. <laughs> yeah, you're a Korean man wearing glasses, and you know, sweatshirt and beige pants. That's it. You make ghost, you have a problem. You make Buddha, also have a problem. So that's why in the old days they said, meet Buddha, kill Buddha. That's Zen. Tang Dynasty China, all the masters, all of them, especially Unmun. Unmun, he didn't spare anyone. People kept raving about Buddha's birthday. Buddha, 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 always. And they were so overwhelmed by their, by their thinking that when they asked Unmun what he would say on Buddha's birthday, he said, if I had met the Buddha when he was born, I would have killed him, cut his flesh into pieces, and fed him to a hungry dog. And then there would be peace. <laughs> so don't follow anything which appears in your consciousness. If you truly understand the meaning of Unmun's words, then it does you a great deal of good. Okay? It really helps you. Then it stops your mind making ghosts and making Buddhas. Don't do that. It's not necessary. If a, child, if a child was playing with toys, of course we let that happen. No problem. Children need to do that. They need to imagine things. They need to make things. But then the adults say, that, okay, now it's time to stop playing. And we eat. Then you sleep a little. We go for a walk. Then you do your homework. Okay? So that means getting real. So please, don't make ghost. Don't make Buddha. Keep clear, OK? Try to be. Do it. Do it. Very good. More questions? One and two. And then soon, it's over. Ladies first. Uh, venerable, I don't know what is allowed. <laughs> What is love? Two problems. Venerable, that's okay. Yeah. What is love, you're yeah. asking me? Yeah. You have a boyfriend or a husband, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, mm, Buddhism emphasizes on the love and confession, mm -hmm. but I don't know what is love. Okay, there are two kinds of love. One is small and the other is big. Which one do you want? <laughs> <laughs> All of them. All of them. Very smart. <laughs> she doesn't know what's what yet. So she doesn't want to lose even the small one. So small love is really based on I, my, me, OK? It's based on like and dislike. It's based just on the senses, just on the senses. This small love actually has big fire, but it burns out very soon. And there's ashes right after that. So great love has light, not so much fire. Okay? Like the song? Yeah. It doesn't run out. This light nourishes all beings without distinction, OK? And if you live your married life or your kind of partnership in that way, then this great love saves your relationship. Really? But I haven't experienced the great love. I cannot imagine it. What is a great love? Uh, no problem. I think it will come. <laughs> Okay? It will come because human beings are imperfect, relationships are impermanent. So you have to experience something greater than just love based on I, my, me. In fact, most people have that selfless part, but sometimes that part is not strong enough. So they collapse into their egos, collapse into their dualistic thinking, or emotions in this case, when their relationship is a little shaky. So. In a marital relationship, when you have a marriage, small love is 
How do I become happy? Great love is how do I make the other person happy? It is very difficult to, to add, <laughs> love uh, other people. I have no doubt that you will learn that because it's really important. As long as your kind of happiness is focused on yourself, it remains small. Ne the person right next to you with whom you live your life, your family, how to make them happy, that means you shift focus from yourself to other beings. And then it results in this great love and compassion. How do I help all beings? How do I help the whole world? Okay? It do these, these things do not negate each other. You can be a lay woman and a bodhisattva together, having a family and helping this world. It is possible, and several people in this room are doing that. I know. So they, it's a great, great thing. It's possible. And there are great stories from Vimalakirti to Busor Gosa, you know. They lived enlightened lives. They had, you know, wives and, you know, husband, etc., etc. They had children. And it worked. Everything's possible. If you believe in it 100% and you make it happen. Everything's possible. But if small love really has big fire, then soon burnout, ashes, dissatisfaction, depression, unhappiness. So change that. Stop focusing on yourself and try to work and live for other beings' happiness. And guess what happens? comes back. Okay, it comes back to you. So don't be afraid to give it out. Don't be afraid that you will have nothing. Only the other will be happy and you will remain just as unhappy as you were. It's not going to happen like that. I'm afraid of that. Really? How much this fear helps you? How much this fear helps? Yeah. Does this fear help you? Afraid helps me. Does this help you? Or not? That's my question to you. I don't know. Bosani. <laughs> Examine that. This is very small, don't know, okay? Fear doesn't help. Fear paralyzes. Fear gives you distorted views. So if fear helped, I would encourage you to continue that mindset and live with that. You have hindrance, you have fear. You have no hindrance, you have no fear. Remember that. It's in the Heart Sutra. So if you practice, you remove your mind's hindrances, you remove your self-centered you know, mind, and then there will be no hindrance for you. And then living in happiness just by trying to make your family happy and help other people, it is possible. Yeah, I need some practice. Absolutely, we all do. <laughs> the last question today, we are really running out of time. I feel like I should say what I'm about to say from outside the room on a bus moving away from here. Don't be afraid. It's fine. I'm not afraid, but I don't want to offend. I've been in Korea for eight years, and I've been dealing with and teaching and learning from Koreans for 13. And I have to say, I feel that Confucianism is the obstacle to people's understanding of love. It is the obstacle to people's understanding and use of democracy. It is the obstacle to their enlightenment. That's just an observation, and I'm sure I'm 90% wrong. And I hope I will be proven to be 100% wrong. But someone earlier said, in response to your advice, something about tradition. And I find that tradition is often the obstacle. Mindless adherence to things to make other people happy. And this wonderful person in the front who said she doesn't know what love is, I feel that it is because it is, not, it is not taught here as much as Confucianism is taught. And he's not a monk, but in a way he's a bodhisattva. Leo Bascaglia, a professor in America who has since passed, he has written and spoken volumes on love and he says this that it is a learned thing and from reading him I believe it has precepts and people don't know how to practice love that's why they believe in Korea that it dies after three years which is a preposterous travesty of human existence in my opinion actually I think it's good if you stay with us and not go on that bus away <laughs> that's one but I fear that I've, I hurt people when I say that but I feel it has to be said no. Because I don't think I've it heard this personal. so many times in Korea from my students, from adults and children. I don't know what love is, and it's the saddest thing I've ever heard. So let me ask you, if you have this clear and sharp observation, how do you intend to help? What's your alternative? By loving people, I suppose. How do you do that? 
I don't know. I suppose by remaining open, listening, and loving them back, uh, setting examples. Around, 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 around. But you also feel that your answer is not to the point, right? I beg your pardon? You also feel that your answer is not to the point. It's going around the point. Well, I originally wanted to say don't know, but I realized that that would be a knee-jerk reaction. That's wrong, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally in it's wrong. So first of all, there is no tradition. There are human minds following certain patterns. Outside of these minds, there is no tradition. When I spoke of hindrances, I meant any kind of attachment to an individual idea, to a collective idea, to a historical idea, or to a very recent idea. You know, elsewhere in the world, in America, there are very fresh ideas about love, and equally they may not work. You know? So in this case, although you may want to help, making right and wrong doesn't help. That's one. Making right and wrong does not remove any obstacles. And uh, knowing about it and feeling it are not necessarily corresponding together. OK? So what is the actual way? Find just one person whom you love 100%. That transforms you. We can read books about it. We can belong to this or that society. But just one person whom you love 100%, totally selfless, ready to die for her, in your case probably. So that transforms you. That radiates better than any words, any books. And this great selfless love is ready to help all beings. It's the best solution. And don't look for overall, general, social solutions. Many smart people have done that, and some of them had the power to put it into practice. Imagine you are the new Confucius, and you put your principles into this society, and you teach them. You use these books, and you use your ideas to create another set of dogmas. How would that be? So I think. If we ask the right questions and we have the right direction, we are on the path to awakening and to true love. But just like enlightenment cannot be defined, true love cannot be defined either. But we all feel whether it works or not, whether we have it or not, whether it's reflected in the other's eyes or not. And if we are sincere enough, we will always strive to become more awakened. We always strive, really, sincerely and wholeheartedly, to love and help all beings. And for that, I wish all of us a very, very happy journey, full of events, challenges, tigers. <laughs> <laughs> and I also wish that in the future we could meet again, share the Dharma again, and make steps together on the path again. And before I say my last thank you to all of you, I would like to truly appreciate the kindness, the openness, and helpfulness of Chong Asunim, the founder of this library, all the library staff, all our permanent members of this place, also members of other Buddhist places that come here regularly to educate themselves, to practice together, and to have one mind on the path. Thank you very much.